provincial election, uh, uh, we will kill this uh, this uh, NDP uh, uh, tunnel concept, uh, which again, we don't believe will ever see the light of uh, day anyway, because uh, it won't make its way through the environmental assessment process. And yes, uh, we will dust off the uh, 10 lane Massey uh, bridge project, which we had uh, ready to go. Uh. Fleming says if that were to happen, it would be moving backwards. It would uh, involve years and years of delay. It would hit the reset button on the environmental assessment process that uh, is in public comment period right now. The interchange is expected to be in operation in 2025 to relieve congestion in the area. If the NDP's plans go through, the tunnel is set to open to traffic five years later in 2030. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. The BC Wildfire Service has issued its late summer forecast today, warning hot and dry weather could still pose a threat. Which, although you would know it right now in the lower mainland and across most of BC, it's it's wet, which is a good thing. But um, we have we are hoping for a better season this summer. As every British Columbian knows, we're regularly facing some of the toughest wildfire conditions. RCMP is. The province has recorded just 217 wildfires this year. That's half the usual average, but the agency says hot spells and lightning can quickly create hazardous conditions. Northern BC is considered at greatest risk right now. Some BC wildfire crews are in the Yukon right now fighting fights as a heat wave scorches Canada's north and Alaska. After facing some pushback, a cannabis shop is set to open near UBC's campus in Vancouver. And the University Student Society says it welcomes the decision. We just think the UBC student body really deserves to have a safe space nearby where purchasing cannabis is accessible and provided in a stress-free environment. We also believe that it will bring collective benefits. Um, of course, there's student employment, but... What's important to remember is while cannabis use may not be universal, education, responsible access and safe communities are priorities that benefit everyone. The decision was made by a Metro Vancouver committee for electoral area A, an online petition against the store gathered about 1900 signatures. Opponents argue the shop will put vulnerable children at high risk of exposure to substances. But a petition in favor of the dispensary got more than 2000 signatures. The store is set to open in time for the start of the fall semester. A warning to beachgoers in Vancouver, several beaches have advisories in effect due to E. coli contamination. As Benid Breach reports, frustrated residents say more needs to be done to prevent the reoccurring health hazard. Rodrigo Silva de Paula calls himself a waterman. He spends about 330 days a year in the ocean teaching paddleboarding. But high E. coli levels in some of Vancouver's beaches are testing his patience. It is frustrating because it is not the first time it happens. He has to change training locations every time advisories happen, and he wants more to be done by the city. Everything under you is, can be relatively toxic. It really changes the way I operate. E. coli can cause gastrointestinal issues, skin to eye infections. And the Vancouver Health Authority says there can be several causes, from animal to human waste, leaking septic tanks from boats, stormwater runoff, and sewer overflows. The adverse weather events always cause adverse infections, basically and it stresses our current hygiene systems for sure. He says heavy rains to floods could also mean higher levels of E. coli in our waters with climate change. Swimming beaches can close when a single sample finds over 400 E. coli in 100 millimeters of water. A report from July 1st found Deep Cove had around 9,200 E. coli per 100 millimeters of water. But this week, those levels have gone way down and Deep Cove is no longer on advisory. Bob Putnam says that level was unusual around his kayak center. It is a very high reading that they got and that's kind of uh, uh, concerning a little bit as to why that happened. If advisories kick in, it could mean changing the location of lessons for children and for others it means paddling on but avoiding swimming. We would encourage people to wash their hands. We find most people aren't too concerned about it. The City of Vancouver says there's ongoing efforts to deal with E. coli. This includes separating storm water from house sewage with different pipes so both don't overflow into our waters and pump out services for boats in areas like False Creek and Coal Harbor. Currently, Trout Lake, Sandy Beach and Snug Cove have E. coli advisories in effect. While the water can look tempting on a sunny day, experts say it's best to avoid splashing in. Benit Breach, CBC News, Vancouver. 
And if you are planning to head out to Vancouver's shores, it might be a good idea to pack a folding chair or two. The park board will not be bringing back the beach logs they took away during the pandemic. We did find with the logs removed, more people did pack in and pack out their garbage. There's just a little and less places for things to sort of hide and linger for longer periods of time. The park board removed the logs in early 2020 to encourage social distancing. And now it says the beaches have been cleaner, safer and easier to maintain without them. The park board says some logs are still around to limit the movement of sand on walkways, but multiple rows have been removed. And Kaljeet Kayla joins us now with a look at the forecast. It's a good day to share the weather when it's nice and sunny because this morning wasn't uh, this setting in clear skies, but now it kind of turned around. You know, it caught everybody by surprise this morning, and we do have a time lapse of that this morning, uh, just after 5 o'clock till about 9.30. Eric, one of our uh, editor extraordinaires, caught this. Look at this low-lying cloud that uh, came across Metro Vancouver and the Lower Mainland, dumped some rain into uh, areas of the Tri-Cities. Uh, just a very low-pressure system. It came off the coast, and now it's making its way through the Lower Mainland and up towards the Caribbean and the Kootenai regions. So it was a bit of a surprise, and I got a lot of messages today saying, when are we going to see summer? So I'm going to try to answer that question for you today. So after that system passed through, it pushed up towards uh, the Caribou, bringing thunderstorm activity for Prince George, as I was mentioning, also for Cranbrook and Kelowna. And that is our other big weather story for today. Thunderstorm warnings in effect for Cranbrook, Kelowna, uh, uh, Quinnell, Williams Lake and Prince George. It's going to be uh, bringing in gusty winds of up to 70 kilometers an hour. Lots of rain, some hail. Lows will be dropping down to 9 overnight, so it will get nice and cool. Uh, for uh, the next little while, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see this uh, low-pressure system remain above here, clearing in time for the lower mainland, just in time for the weekend, which is some really great news. Our current temperatures right now sitting at 22 at YVR, 23 in uh, Pitt Meadows and 24 in Abbotsford. How long will it be nice and clear? I'll answer that question coming up. Looking Isabel. forward to the answers. Thanks, Kaljeet. You may have seen them rummaging through dumpsters, stalking campsites, and prowling through parks in search of food. Black bear sightings across the West Coast have been popping up on social media in recent weeks, including one that chased some birds in Burnaby Central Park recently. But what should you do if you come across a black bear? To tell us more on how to be bear aware, let's bring in the program manager for Wild Safe BC, Vanessa Isnardi. So, Vanessa, what is drawing bears to explore more residential neighborhoods? Do you think that this is more more common this summer or are we just seeing them more because of social media posts? I think it's a bit of both. I think uh, it is definitely a year where we're seeing above average reports of black bears in urban communities, but also people are sharing these, uh, taking the time to take some videos of these black bears in communities. And we urge people to please make sure you keep a distance from black bears when you see them uh, and make sure that you don't run if you encounter a black bear in your community. So what do you do if you do see a bear? You did um, mention not running away, which I'm sure in the moment you have to mentally talk yourself out of doing that. So what should you do if you encounter a black bear versus a, a brown bear? I've heard uh, there might be different um, things that you should do. So what do you do? So we have both black bears and grizzly bears in British Columbia. We tend to hear more about black bears because they're much more numerous. So chances are, especially if you're living in an urban environment, uh, you're going to encounter a black bear or a brown colored black bear. It's just a different color coat. And the most important things, if you see them on trails, you need to make sure if you have a pet, you keep it on a leash. Do not let your pet chase after bears. That can bring an angry bear back on you. And it's important that you stay calm and you back away from the area and you give that bear plenty of space. Any yelling or or screaming. I, I've seen that on online too, which I'm happy we have you because we've got someone who, who can tell us because I'm sure on the internet we've got lots of things, but would you scream, make any noises? Most black bears near urban environments are just foraging for food and they're not interested in us. We don't need to aggravate or yell at them unless they start approaching us intentionally. That is a very rare situation and then you do want to be firm with the bear and let it know not to approach you. Um, if you have a bear in your in your yard and you can do so safely, 
you can clap your hands and be firm and encourage that bear to leave your backyard. But it doesn't do any good if you don't address the root causes of why bears linger in our communities. And that's unsecured sources of food. You need to manage those attractants. And that's number one. That was going to be my next question. What do you do uh, to prevent them from coming into urban areas? Are there a few tips um, other than maybe just being careful with your garbage, I guess? Well, it's you need to expect that black bears are always going to be in natural spaces bordering our communities. We have lush vegetation, lots of travel corridors. Bears will always be nearby. So it's up to all of us to manage all attractant and food sources. And that includes bird feeders that are accessible, the grease from barbecues, unmanaged compost. And for people that keep urban chickens or livestock, you need to use electric fencing. Interesting. Did not think of the bird feeders or the barbecue, so I appreciate that information. Thanks. That is Vanessa Isnardi, with the, is the program manager of WildSafe BC. Thanks so much for joining us and showing us how to be a little bit more bear aware. Thank you for your time. Meanwhile, Cat Lake in Squamish is open again, but with a warning about bears. The site was closed late last month because an aggressive bear seen looting campsites and going through tents, and conservation officers are warning campers to take necessary precautions, including keeping coolers locked in vehicles and not leaving food unattended. What's summertime without a music festival or two after the break? We take a look at the street parties coming to a neighborhood near you. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. Not that long ago, it was voted one of Canada's top neighborhoods. But is Osborne Village in Winnipeg still a place to be? Stephanie Cram takes a look. The face of Osborne Village is changing. On the corner of Osborne and Gertrude, a building has come down. My overall vision is just to see another young, vibrant Osborne Village back to life. For Adam Sharp, vibrancy means replacing the old block with a new multi-use building, a mixture of residential and commercial spaces. He bought the building not only for its potential, but because of childhood memories of trips to the village. The old Dutch maid, you come in and it was the same when I bought it. They still had like the pads where the stools used to be and the different countertops that they used to walk behind. So it was just an absolute trip down memory lane. After an inspection, the original building was deemed not structurally sound so it had to come down. But the goal is to build a space for folks to create new memories at. I hope that with the new development, there's going to be a younger generation that's going to be able to say a lot of the same in 20, 30 years' time. This development isn't the only thing changing in Osborne. The Osborne Village Biz says despite the few shuttered buildings along the stretch, coming out of the pandemic, the neighbourhood is thriving. Osborne Village is actually on an upswing right now and we're continuing to grow. I'm really excited about all these new developments and this new trajectory for Osborne Village. Lindsay Summer says 20 new businesses have opened up along the stretch since 2020. And because of the walkability and close proximity to amenities, there is a growing need for more residential spaces in the neighbourhood. When you travel to cities around the world and they're thriving and busy and urban, Osborne Village has all those ingredients, but they, we haven't had any vision or leadership to really move them all forward with a cohesive direction. The city gave the biz close to $30,000 to make a new neighbourhood plan, which will set the direction for the village. It's also a place that you can do it all. You can, you can work there. You can shop there, you can live there, you can party there. And that's, uh, in a nutshell, what's great about Osborne Village. People count on it for that. Despite the memories of what Osborne once was, Sherry Rollins says younger generations see the potential, making the village the new place to be. Stephanie Cram, CBC News, Winnipeg.
Calgary Stampede is back in full force after two years of cancellations and COVID restrictions. And as Alison Dempster shows us, the event is a window into neighboring Alberta's pandemic legacy and its recovery. Yahoo! It's back. For the first time since 2019, Calgarians are celebrating a full stampede and they're ready to do it in their usual boot stomping style. I love the energy that is created. Like even right now, just it just wakes up the entire city. Things are on the rebound in Calgary and this is one of the first times we get to celebrate that. And where there are pancakes, there are politicians. COVID was a divisive time and division in, in our society and families and, and uh, Let's let's make the, let's make Stampede a healing time. Let's have a bit of fun after two really serious years. The Stampede can be a bellwether for the local economy, and this year's celebrations are being fueled by soaring oil and gas prices. This is a comeback for Calgary in a way, and it's also being buoyed by the fact that yes, oil prices are high, natural gas prices are high. We're seeing that economic diversification. So many different companies are part of Stampede this year that we've never seen as part of it. And when you talk to the Stampede, they'll tell you that corporate sponsorships are back to 2019 levels. A sign of that optimism, this busy warehouse. Event planners in Calgary are in such high demand for corporate shindigs, they're having a hard time finding staff and supplies. But they say it's a good problem to have. Oh, a lot of people are excited to gather and to celebrate, which is wonderful. Stampede organizers say they need this buzz and excitement after the pandemic blew a hole in their budget. We lost $26 million two years ago. Last year we put on a partial stampede and lost $8.5 million. Uh, we don't expect to make it up overnight, but we're off to a good start right now. Organizers say they're planning for more than a million visitors. As Canada's oil capital uncorks a stampede celebration the city hasn't seen in some time. Alison Dempster, CBC News, Calgary. With what's looking like a sunny weekend ahead of us here in Metro Vancouver, what could be better than heading outdoors to party with a few hundred friends? From the Catsalano Street Party to Carnival del Sol, the arts and music festival season is back. And after a few lackluster summers, this year is shaping out to be the most active since before the pandemic. For more on what we can look forward to, I'm speaking with Rebecca Bullwit. You might know her as the publisher of Mix, Miss604.com and the writer for the website uh, Festival Seekers. Now, Rebecca, uh, what's coming up if people want to get involved in the music scene this weekend in the weeks to come here? Yep, so definitely. You mentioned Catsalano Festival. That's a big one. It's actually Vancouver's largest free music and arts festival and it's on West 4th between Burrard McDonald and they'll have a ton of concerts all day on Saturday and then if you'd like uh, something in New Westminster Queen's Park Arts Festival which is actually on now and it'll be going until Sunday and they have concerts at the Band Shell they also have something at the Queen's Park Farm which I forget was there it's a great little space and um, yeah more free entertainment for the family yeah and one more not free but ticketed but a very uh Exciting event for many is Faded in the Park in Surrey. Yes. That's at Holland Park. And a lot of big names in the electronic music and R&B and hip hop realm. And actually the weekend played there years and years ago. So if you want to see some acts, some emerging acts too, that's a good one to go to. And I think after the pandemic, people are looking to explore new music, you know, not necessarily everything that they've seen. They just want to get out there and, and hear some new things and see some new performers. Um, anything for people who want to dance and maybe socialize? Yeah, Carnival del Sol is coming up. That's this weekend, too, at Jonathan Rogers Park in Vancouver. And it's the largest Latin American uh, festival in the Pacific Northwest. So another, lots of dancing, lots of music, lots of fun for the whole family there. And then also Vancouver Craft Beer Week is hosting a two-day festival, Saturday and Sunday, uh, at the Peony Grounds. And they'll have over 100 craft breweries there and music, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, Dancing on the Edge Festival. So they're one of the festivals that was online promote most of the pandemic and if you want to actually see dance on the stage and experience in person that's a great one to go to. How exciting has this last few weeks been for you ramping up into summer finally the weather is getting a little bit nicer as someone who focuses a lot and, and highlights a lot of events in the community how has it been having these events coming out now after many summers of nothingness and cancellations <laughs> and virtual yeah it's been so wonderful just to see some of the long-term events coming back you know from their 10th anniversary 20th anniversary and things that have been around for decades like theater in the stars and the stanley park and then all the new festivals that are popping up like vancouver mural festival and all the great stuff that they're doing yeah, yeah and would you 
think that you think it'll be busier than it's been in, in even years before the pandemic? Or what, what's your sense that people are excited to go back? Or you think people will be easing into it and maybe not as busy as we would have seen pre-pandemic? Do you have any kind of sense of what it might be like? I think people are really excited to go back, but I think there's so many things to do now. Our time might be split between right. events, so they might not be as busy, but let, let's hope they are anyway for right. the organizers and volunteers and sponsors. Yeah. And I guess because there's been no events, they're all coming back at the same time and we've got limited time. So we're trying our best to fit it all in, in one summer. Yeah, so it's essential. a good problem to have. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thanks to Rebecca. Rebecca Bullwit is the publisher of Miss604.com and the writer um, for other um, websites as well, including Festival Seekers. So thank you so much for joining us. A political shakeup in Great Britain. Boris Johnson resigns one key role, but remains the country's prime minister for now. The challenge facing the Conservatives there, next. It's just one of many skills required to be a good lifeguard. Speed, endurance, and of course, the ability to stay afloat in rough seas. The Australians are widely recognized as the best on the physical side. Around it! But when it comes to first aid, actual life-saving skills, Vancouver's lifeguards come out on top. A lot of work to be a lifeguard in Australia as well. They have to be very fit. Up here, they, we don't have to be as fit, but we do have to be much more qualified in first aid and CPR. They're more technical, I think, here. We just, we're in it, I think, more for the competition than the first aid side of it. And here, they're really into the first aid part, yeah. Australian lifeguards compete in relays like this one all the time. That competition gives them exposure, and that exposure prompts more and more people to sign up. Yeah. How long was it? Three minutes? Oh, I can more people involved in general. Over there, um, even though the life-saving part of it is large, the competition side of it is very much to the forefront. And we're, that's why the Australians have the strength that they have had for a number of years, because the competitive side of it is so big. In Australia, lifeguards only need a basic understanding of life-saving skills, unlike Canadian lifeguards who must be certified in first aid. So it's not seen as a sport here, more as a medical precaution. But when it comes to physical competition, anyone in Canada soon could be allowed to take part. We would like to move towards that. Um, so that people could come down and do a run, swim, run. Um, anybody could do it. Anybody could do it. The Royal Life Saving Society of Canada hopes to get more people involved in physical competition by staging more events like this one, making the sports side of life saving more visible and more exciting. Chris Edwards, CBC News, Vancouver.
Boris Johnson has resigned as leader of Britain's Conservative Party. His colleagues revolted after yet another scandal. This one involving Johnson's mishandling of a sexual misconduct complaint against an MP. Ashley Burke reports on what happened today and what could come next. This is a day for the history books. We were outside 10 Downing when the crowds of people outside the gates were booing and Prime Minister Boris Johnson walked out of that famous door and up to the microphone to give his resignation speech. He said that he fought tooth and nail to stay on, but it became too much. I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. The resignation followed days of turmoil within the Conservative Party. More ministers and aides quit on one day alone than ever before in Britain's history. Up until late last night, Johnson was defiant, saying he would stay on. But today, that changed amid more resignations and pleas for him to go. I want to thank you, the British public, for the immense privilege that you have given me. And I want you to know that from now on until the new Prime Minister is in place, your interests will be served and the government of the country will be carried on. Now the big question is how long will Johnson stay on as Prime Minister? The leader of the opposition threatened today to try and call a non-confidence vote. He needs to go completely. None of this nonsense about clinging on for a few months. He's inflicted lies, fraud and chaos in the country. And you know, we're stuck with a, function, with a government which isn't functioning in the middle of a cost of living crisis. And all of those that have been propping him up should be utterly ashamed of themselves. Johnson thanked the British public and said, as his friends in politics know, no one is indispensable, even him. Ashley Burke, CBC News, London. And back to this country, a former contender to lead the Conservative Party of Canada says he will fight his disqualification. Patrick Brown was booted from the race earlier this week over allegations he broke campaign financing rules. Marina von Sackelberg reports. Patrick Brown has hired a team of high-profile lawyers to fight his disqualification. Sources say there are allegations that a private company was paying some members of his campaign staff. In a letter sent to the Conservative Party, Brown's lawyers say he wasn't involved in any misconduct. They call the decision to remove him from the race politically motivated and preordained. It's clear the party establishment was nervous um, that we were going to beat Pierre Polyev. Brown says his leadership rival, Pierre Polyev, is behind his disqualification, a claim Polyev denies, and Brown has yet to back up with evidence. The Conservative Party won't provide more details on the allegations against Brown, but say the complaint came from within his own camp. We had serious, serious information, serious allegations, allegations that dealt with violating the Canada Elections Act, and Mr. Brown's campaign was provided ample opportunity uh, to respond. Brown says the party establishment didn't like his progressive views. He says he signed up 150,000 new members, many from diverse communities. Former Conservative candidate Simon Lusserat says some of those new Conservatives are now disenchanted. Without the Patrick's vision, which is a bigger, inclusive, multicultural, everybody from every ethnic group is welcomed in this party, we cannot win the general election. As for who will win to lead the Conservative Party, it's unclear whether Brown's supporters will cast a ballot for another progressive candidate or decide not to vote at all. If Patrick Brown is to be believed, is that they joined up because they believed in him. So if he's gone, they may not go anywhere. Where they may go is on having their buttocks sit on their hands. And that's not necessarily a good thing for the Conservative Party or candidates other than Pierre Polyev. The Conservative Party's president says Brown supporters still belong within the party. He's urging them to vote for one of the other five candidates when they choose a new leader this September. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. And late today, a woman who says she was the whistleblower in the Patrick Brown story issued a statement. She says Brown told her she could be employed as a consultant for a company and that company would have her volunteer with the Brown campaign. The woman says as time went on, she suspected that arrangement was not okay and had her lawyer contact the Conservative Party. 
And back in this province, the Assembly of First Nations wrapped up an annual gathering in Vancouver marked by accusations and a power struggle. But as Olivia Stefanovic shows us, National Chief Roseanne Archibald has prevailed. A resolution passed that will lead to a closer look at her allegations of corruption. Keep your lanyards raised as our team counts. An overwhelming majority for an investigation into the Assembly of First Nations finances. Resolution number one, as amended, has been adopted with 75% of the votes. Passed despite lingering concerns, it could trigger a forensic audit dating back 10 years. If we're going to do this, 10 years is too much. It needs to be something more reasonable and affordable. This chief says he's worried the scrutiny could jeopardize the tens of millions of dollars the AFN relies on from Ottawa each year. There's a lot of nervous people and, uh, and funders being one of them. But the Indigenous Services Minister tried to calm those concerns, saying the government will support the AFN whatever it decides. I would be very adverse to any kind of process that would put uh, ongoing funding for First Nations in jeopardy. Under the resolution, a committee of chiefs will review the AFN's practice of rewarding contracts. Its findings will determine whether the organization faces the forensic audit. We have chiefs who are paid to by their communities. They receive a salary and somehow they're getting contracts from the Assembly of First Nations. To me, that's part of the issue. Still, some chiefs say this is a fishing expedition initiated by the national chief who shared a confidential list of people who received AFN contracts. You are destroying the reputations of those people. I'm here to ask the national chief to, to give a public apology. Frustration over internal politics bubbled over during the assembly. But we can't waste any more time on this. Our people need us compelling some to walk out altogether. We spent two days mired in, in just drama. Um, my people are suffering, my community is suffering. We go back to our communities and we, we start discussions around the futures of these organizations. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Vancouver. A federal judge in Minneapolis has sentenced former police officer Derek Chauvin to 21 years in prison on civil rights charges. Chauvin is already serving a 22 and a half year state sentence for the murder of George Floyd. The incident in May 2020 sparked Black Lives Matter protests across the U.S. and around the world. U.S. basketball player Brittany Griner pleaded guilty in a Russian court today to drug charges, but says she didn't intentionally bring cannabis oil into the country. Chris Glover reports from Washington on a case that's attracted the attention of U.S. President Joe Biden. American basketball star Brittany Griner heads into one court she says that continues to terrify her. Her lawyers emerging to confirm Griner pleaded guilty to drug charges while also pleading for leniency. After being arrested at a Moscow area airport in February, Russian police said she had vape cartridges with cannabis oil in her luggage. It was unintentionally brought to, to Russia because she was in a, in a hurry as she was packing. Back at the court she loves in Phoenix, Arizona, her wife Sherelle is leading a growing push. We are not going to ever be quiet until she's home safely. The two-time Olympic gold medalist got a handwritten letter to Biden on Monday, while a collective of more than 1,100 black women leaders also wrote to the president demanding her return, many of her supporters pointing out the unique danger Griner is in. This is a person who's represented our country well. Um, she's also a gay woman. She's also a black woman in Russia. And we need to pay attention to that. The president and vice president called Griner's wife Wednesday, assuring her the U.S. is working to get her home. Honestly, I want people to try and just put themselves in her shoes. Her wife has called Griner a political pawn. The arrest coming just before Russia sent troops into Ukraine amid a low point in Washington-Moscow relations. It wasn't until May the U.S. State Department reclassified Griner's case as wrongfully detained. Russian media say the Kremlin wants a prisoner swap with an arms dealer serving a 25-year sentence in the U.S. We are going to do everything that we can, use every means that we have to bring them home. I'm not going to negotiate from here. If convicted, she could face up to 10 years in prison. I'm frustrated that 140 days have passed since my wife 
has been able to speak to me. One big win for Griner, her lawyers say the court finally agreed to let her call her wife, something she and her wife have long pleaded for. Chris Glover, CBC News, Washington. They say good fences make good neighbors, but what about driveways? In one Ottawa neighborhood, they are a source of conflict. We explain why after the break. And here's a live shot at 6.44, a live look over Sunset Beach and Vanier Park. Aljeet Kayla is back with a look at the full forecast coming up next. And the skies, sunny skies, can look forward to for the week ahead. Five separate cannabis companies walking and working together. They're going to handle the packaging and delivering of their cannabis themselves. We all have similar similar issues where you know we're, we're paying big money for shipping or we're, we're paying a big corp to do our processing. It's called the Tober Rolling Syndicate. In the same facility, they'll take all the flour, roll joints, weigh it, and deliver them to Manitoba's cannabis shops. We'll get to meet and work with the, the bud tenders of the dispensaries when we drop off the products versus having, you know, Pure Later or FedEx just drop it off for us. He found sending just two kilos of cannabis to Ontario and back for processing cost a pricey $1,000. That's what started this idea for the syndicate. Right, right. And it snowballed from there. Lavoie's Toba Grown is joined by Alicanto Gardens, Cypress Craft, Keefe Cannabis, and Natural Earth Craft Cannabis. It just takes so much time. Tim Dirksen is with Natural Earth in Winnipeg. When Jesse approached me with the idea, I was immediately excited about it. Processing is a very, very labor-intensive, time-consuming uh, process to add to your system. The owner of Alicanto Gardens once joked Lavoie should start some kind of partnership. Then he did. I'm kind of, are you serious? I'm in. <laughs> Cypress Craft in Western Manitoba hopes the new alliance will get their products in more stores. He's making a lot of relationships across the province and in other provinces with the stores, so that's going to help us out, I think, a lot. We'll go into the process room now. The packaging will be done out of Selkirk's Keefe Cannabis. Eight people here. have been hired. We're all Manitoba here, and um, we're very proud of it, so we'd like to support the guys that are also growing locally. As far as Jesse Denton knows, this will be a first-of-its-kind joint venture. It um, speaks volumes into you know, how well-connected we are as a province and how well-connected we want to be as an industry, especially locally. The syndicate expects to get rolling within the next 30 days. Ian Fraze, CBC News, Winnipeg. All right, let's bring back Kaljeet with a look at the forecast. That beautiful live shot earlier of the sunset uh, made me very excited to go out once the program is done. Tell me, please, there is more of that weather to come. There is. It's actually going to be quite nice, and it uh, cleared up quite nicely. We didn't start off like that this morning with some showers and clouds, very low-lying clouds, so that's all out of the way. The other big weather story today is that system that moved through Vancouver this morning is now making its way. Look at all this unsettled activity, thunderstorm warnings 
in effect for Caribou, Quesnel, East Kootenay, Prince George, Williams Lake, Cranbrook, and even Kelowna. So that's going to be happening into tomorrow afternoon. Our fire danger rating still very low for the south coast, but for northern BC, still moderate to high with uh, really um, high uh, uh, temperatures, uh, scorching temperatures up there. Uh, let's take a look across Canada today for the highs that we hit uh, in Osoyoos. This was our high for BC, 28 degrees, nice and hot through there. 23 in Vancouver, 24 up in Williams Lake. For Alberta, 22 for Edmonton, 24 in Calgary, not so bad in Madison Hat at 29 degrees today as their high. Tomorrow's forecast, we're still looking at unsettled weather with some thunderstorm activity in Prince George. Williams Lake down to Kelowna, hitting about 25 degrees in Kelowna. We're going to be at about 22 degrees tomorrow here in the lower mainland and in greater Victoria as well. And uh, it's going to get only better after that. Saturday, some more cloud, but 22 degrees, which is above seasonal highs of 21, which is great news. Our weekend looking pretty good. Sunday, a low of 14 overnight, just a little bit of cloud. And then by Monday, it's going to be nice and warm. No clouds in the sky up to a high of a 28 degrees inland for Abbotsford and the Fraser Valley, 24 for Metro Vancouver. And it continues into Tuesday with 28 inland again. Um, you know, above our seasonal high, 24 degrees here for the coast and cooler for Wednesday. Sunshine continues for Thursday, and we're hoping it sticks around because summer took its time getting here. It's been a long time since I've seen that streak of just sunshine, so I am loving it. Thanks so much, Kelty. You're welcome. Is expanding your home's driveway an acceptable move or asking for trouble? Well, that's become a hot topic in an Ottawa suburb where driveway renovations have brought out bylaw officers and measuring tapes. Stu Mills explains why. This cheerful interlock stone pathway hasn't been a problem for the past handful of years. Three years ago, Marilyn Fairfull and her husband added the walkway in case they need a wheelchair in the future. But last November, this 70-year-old looked out the front window to see a bylaw officer crouching near her lawn. I came out of the house to find that she was measuring the walkway. The officer told the Fairfuls that the paving stones made the walkway illegally wide. The stones will have to come out. You don't have to look far to find other homes where the driveway is widened or where the front yard has been replaced entirely with paving stones or houses where the car has been parked entirely on the yard. But we asked, and these residents haven't been issued notices of violation. That's because Ottawa's bylaw enforcement is triggered by complaints, and apparently nobody has complained. How is that fair when other people continue to have a walkway the same width or to park on their walkway? So this is what I'd have to... Remember. Julian Demansky is asking himself the same question. This year, the 82-year-old was told he'd have to put his driveway back to a width it hasn't been in nine years. I'm not looking for trouble here. I'm too old to be looking for trouble. So I'm sure Baila has much more important things to do than this. The new official plan includes... Uh, but officials in the city's planning department say whether enforcement is triggered by a complaint or not, driveways are getting too wide. When driveways do balloon, there's too little on-street parking, too little greenery, and ultimately too much heat. There's a cumulative impact to um, not complying with the bylaw and it results in more and more paved area which makes neighborhoods hotter. The city says Ottawa's bylaws about driveway width will be more important as climate change brings hotter summers and hotter suburbs. Stu Mills, CBC News, Ottawa. It's a trend you may have seen on TikTok or maybe playing out in real life at the movies. We explain the minions craze and the people behind it. Stay with us. That's the sound an e-scooter makes to alert others when one is approaching pedestrians. If your scooter happens to go on a sidewalk, you'll hear this. Sidewalk riding detected. Please ride on the street. Before the engine comes to a stop. Just some of the new range of technology enhancements featured on Neuron's e-scooters, including stiffer penalties for those who don't follow the rules. Isaac Ransom with Neuron Mobility says the ride won't end until you park the scooter in its designated parking spot. 
If you discard the scooter outside of there, you'll continue to be charged for your ride until you return it to that designated parking area. So essentially, we're incentivizing people to park properly uh, by, by, by continually uh, uh, charging them if they don't park in that area. Councillor Tim Tierney says this summer only 900 e-scooters will hit the streets compared to 1,200 last year. You know what? I think it, it talks to you a lot more. It will tell you you're, you're too close to the sidewalk, you're on the sidewalk. It's always given indicators to, to keep the experience very safe, not only for the rider, but for the pedestrian as well. However, accessibility advocates remain skeptical about the software upgrades. Wayne Antle with the Alliance for Equality of Blind Canadians worries the new tech won't live up to its promises. We actually asked the city uh, to have people with disabilities involved in testing this new technology or, and, and seeing how it will work before the successful candidate uh, candidates were selected. But we were told that couldn't, uh, we couldn't uh, be part of it. The city says two companies have been selected to return this year. Neuron Mobility, which returned Wednesday, and Bird Canada, which will hit the streets next week. A third company, which has operated in the city, Lime Electric Scooters, will not return this year. Rochelle Sufi, CBC News, Ottawa. I'm Amy Bell and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join CBC Vancouver at the 15th annual Surrey Fusion Festival, a celebration of food, music and culture on July 23rd and 24th at Holland Park. Plus, it's free to attend. Visit surreyfusionfestival.ca for more info. And tune in to On the Coast Wednesdays for The Climate Changers, a new special series about the people who are taking action against climate change. Learn more at cbc.ca slash bc. If you've been to the movie theater lately, there's a good chance you've seen a small army of young people dressed in yellow suits. They call themselves gentle minions. Here's Lisa Shing on a new craze propelled by TikTok. It may not be surprising to see scores of teenagers at the movies, but seeing them in suits, being extra polite, and sometimes carrying bananas, that's new. It made us laugh so much. It was such a nice experience. Behold the latest TikTok craze. This video posted by Rashid Tabara shows him and a group of friends like so many others decked out and heading out for a screening of Minions, The Rise of Gru. We've all loved the Minions as kids. And when we saw this movie releasing, it started becoming like a big trend. So I feel like that kind of like forced us to be like, we should do it. These self-described gentle minions are hitting theaters all over the world, mostly teenage boys, mostly well-mannered, as an homage to minions from the long-running Despicable Me film franchise. Innocent fun, sure, but not without a little controversy. Some theaters in the UK say loud, rowdy teens have forced them to shut down screenings, even turn away anyone showing up in a jacket and tie. 
Even though this gentle minions trend has been a bit of a concern in some countries, Canadian theaters say they're embracing the enthusiasm. What we saw this past week and continue to see, it's been pretty special, pretty unique. Distinguished villains, my name is Gro. And after COVID caused a 20-year low in ticket sales, the crowds are welcome. There's nothing more exciting and more fun to watch than packed auditoriums. This pop culture critic says the appeal is simple. When there's an opportunity to do something that is an experience, then that's interesting to people, and especially, I think, young people, and a chance to feel like you're part of something bigger. Dressed up or not, seeing young people out and having fun again isn't just welcome, it's good for business. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. And thanks for being with us tonight on CBC News at 6. We do want to remind you, if you're not already watching us on CBC Gem, that is our free app. Check it out. That's all for us tonight. Thanks for watching. Good night.